Welcome to Angels in the Glen. Today's lesson is Daniel and the lion's den. Now, this is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It's where Daniel's enemies conspire against him and they trick the king to throw him into the lion's den despite his innocence. Now, we're going to unpack all the details of this particular story, but there's a grander message going on. There's a greater truth that we're going to learn about end times in terms of the laws of God versus the laws of men. We're going to see that this story is about the laws of the Medes and Persians, and it goes against the laws of God, and Daniel stays faithful and devoted to the laws of God. We're going to see that same pattern emerge in end times, and we're going to see that it is the exact pattern that will happen when end times come upon and engulf the whole world. And we'll go through that in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And I'll just give you a flavor of that in this particular lesson today. So we're going to cover one, Daniel's faithful devotion, and cover the stories, the details of this. And then we're going to go into the devotion of God's people in the same way during end times. Let's open up in prayer. Father God, I just pray that you would teach us these greater truths so that we would be ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. Now, context here is we've seen a transition from the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire. Darius is the king. He just received the, the kingdom at age 62 in the last verse of chapter 5. So now he's going to appoint 120 satraps. These are governors. These are uh, administrators, if you will, that will manage the affairs of the kingdom. And then he says, verse 2, And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Now stop right there. See, the kingdom is being run by these administrators, and he wants to make sure that there's integrity and continuity and prosperity in his kingdom because many government officials would have been skimming off the top. And he wants to make sure that there's a, there's a, there's a stability in his kingdom, and so he wants to make sure that he has... A, an effective administration so that he doesn't lose money, okay? He wants to prosper. So he's putting smart men, men who can manage the kingdom for him. Daniel's one of those. Now look at this next verse, verse 3. Then this Daniel began, began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Now this is very interesting. Daniel possesses an extraordinary spirit. Darius is now interacting with Daniel, just new to the kingdom, okay? The transition has occurred, and he sees an extraordinary spirit in him. And I want to ask you this question. How did Daniel, why does Daniel have this extraordinary spirit? Where does it all begin? It all begins when he was a youth back in Jerusalem because he received a godly, biblical education. Because when he gets taken captive to Babylon and, he, and, he's, uh, and he's asked or he is, is exposed to the king's choice food and the king's choice wine, what does he say? He says, no, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to defile myself with these foods, whether it be sacrificed to idols, whether there be blood in it. And how does God respond to Daniel's choice? He gives him great wisdom. He gives him the ability to understand dreams and visions. And so Daniel here has been a faithful, devoted Jewish man, and he's growing up all the way through the Babylonian Empire. Now he's in the Medo-Persian Empire. He's an old man now. He's much older. He's in his 80s. Okay, he served God in his youth, and he continues to serve him in his old age. Now think about that. That's extraordinary. He's in his 80s, 
and he's distinguishing himself even in his elderly age. Amazing. I mean, I get so convicted by this when I read about this, that he's in his 80s and he's still working. He's still exerting himself. He's still using all of his talents that God has given him. He is still exercising his abilities that God has given him. And it's so much so that the king recognizes it. And he says, you know what? I, I'm, I think I'm going to appoint him over the entire kingdom. I mean, that's extraordinary. And so Daniel has been working on his character, his worth, work ethic, his ability to communicate, his ability to interact with others. And now he's to the point where the king says, Daniel's the man. All right. And I want to say this, you know, we're all going to be aging. We're all moving through life. This, the, the river of time moves on and doesn't slow down for anyone. Take a look at Isaiah 46, verse 3 and 4. Listen to me, O house of Jacob. This is a promise. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, you who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it and I will carry you and I will bear you and I will deliver you. What an amazing promise. As we age, as we grow older, as we move on in the history of time, God is with us. And he was with Daniel in his elderly years. And he can be with you throughout your youth and throughout your middle age and throughout even in your final elderly years. God is with you. What a great promise. He never leaves us. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. I want to point this out. It's something that reminds me of how we should interact with our elders. Okay. I know when I was a youth, I would look at those that were older. I wouldn't think much of them. Okay. But the Lord says we should honor them. In Leviticus 19.32, it says this, you shall rise up before the gray headed and honor the aged and you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. Wow. If you're a youth out there, I feel like I'm middle age. Okay, I can look back at my youth in my teens and 20s and 30s and I can say, wow. And I can look now and say, wow, I can see these elderly. That's where I'm going. <laughs> okay, it's nothing to fear, but we need to reverence and honor our elders. Okay, and here in this verse, it says, you shall rise up before them, meaning respect them. Okay, and so I just wanted to point that out. Daniel's in his elderly age here. And if we keep moving on, in fact, you know, it's amazing. Everything in the Bible is so tied together. Uh, if you just look at that next verse in verse 33 of Leviticus 19 on the screen, when a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know, I'm confident Daniel, when he was taken captive, he knew this scripture. He was raised right. He knew that his people were, were taken out of captive from Egypt and brought to Jerusalem and brought to the promised land. Now he's taken up captive and he knows this. I know Daniel was interacting with the locals like they were his own. Okay. Because he knew this story and it's the same today, wherever we're at, if aliens are among us, wherever native country we're in, what does the scripture say? It says, they shall be as native among you. Okay. You won't discriminate against them. And it says you shall love them as yourself. God wants all of his people to be at peace with one another. Okay. I don't want to get too far off this, but you can see how the Bible's tied together. Let's move on to the next verse. Verse four. Then the commissioners and satraps begin trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. You see, these men are jealous men. They see what Darius is doing. They see Daniel's distinguishing himself. They see that he has an extraordinary spirit. They see the spirit of God is upon Daniel and they see that he's about to be raised above them all. Now they are worldly men. Naturally that would inspire that would cause them to have feelings of jealousy, resentment. Who is this 
one of the Hebrews, okay, one of the Hebrew captives from Judea. How is it that he's going to be raised above all of us? So now, what does it say? They could find no ground of accusation. See, they wanted to, they knew they were all corrupt. They knew that each one of them had skimmed off the system that took advantage of their position. And they said, you know what? Let's find out what he did and expose that. Okay? Because an accusation is to bring a charge against someone to identify some sort of offense against the affairs of that particular government. And so they said, I'm sure we can find it. We can find it with Daniel because we're all corrupt too. And, and what, did, what does it say in the verse? Go back to the verse. It says, but they found they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence of corruption was to be found in him. Now I think about that and I say to myself, you know, is there any corruption or negligence on our part with our employer, whomever we work for? Do we could take advantage of maybe the travel budget? Do we take advantage of maybe the copier? What about pens and pencils and paper clips? I'm not being silly here, I'm being realistic. Do we take advantage of our positions in our companies or wherever we may work? Okay? God wants there to be no corruption, no negligence on our part. We should be faithful, honest, obedient employees with whomever we work. Okay, and they couldn't find anything. But look at this next verse. This is the key verse. This is the key verse, the whole chapter in understanding end times. Look at verse five. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Wow. The only way they're going to find any ground of accusation is against the law of his God. Think about this. They're basically saying, my words, Daniel is a tried and true Christian. He is a Bible believer. He is walking in obedience to this book. Okay? And they said, the only way we're going to find a ground of accusation is if we get him to try to violate, that he won't violate his faithful walk with the Lord. Okay? They know that he's such a committed Christian. My words again. He's such a committed Christian. He's so committed to the law of God. He's so committed to his devotion and obedience to God that they said, that's how we'll get him. We'll figure out a way so that he will demonstrate his faith because he's not going to violate his faith. He's going to demonstrate a continued faith and a continued obedience to the Lord God Almighty. And when he demonstrates that, that's how we're going to get him. Because we know he's a committed Christian, okay? If he wasn't a committed Christian, if he was a compromising Christian, if he was a hypocrite, if he was constantly had one foot in the world and one foot in the church, then they'd say, well, we can get him. That's easy, okay? But Daniel, with Daniel, they said, no, because he's a committed Christian, that's how we're going to trap him, okay? Let's move on. We're going to talk about that some more. Verse 6. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors, have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Now, a couple of points to make about these particular scriptures. One is it says in verse 7, do you see the first word in verse 7, at least in the NASB? It says, all, all the kings, all the commissioners of the kingdom. Did all of them actually, do you think they were all present? I don't think so. Daniel wasn't present, <laughs> otherwise he might have said something. But Daniel's not present, and I don't even think all the 120 satraps and the other two potential presidents were there, okay? There was probably a small group of people who the king trusted and probably listened to them. And some people might say, 
wow, were they playing off the king's ego? And I think in our Western minds, it, it, we, we think that way. But back then, in those ancient times, there may have been an emergency. There may have been something that have occurred with the transition of the kingdom from Babylon to Medo-Persia. Because Babylonians worship the, the Babylonian gods. Now we have a change in administration, and now you have the Medo-Persian reign. So it's possible uh, that there was some sort of emergency in, in which to, to stabilize the religious, um, um, the religious um, happenings in terms of who people were worshiping. So they said, let's stabilize this, and we'll, we'll say no one can worship except this man, Darius. So I don't believe necessarily that it was the king's ego that allowed him to sign it. I think there would, there would have been some sort of emergency to at least stabilize what was going on in society at that time, okay? Because the king, it doesn't, he doesn't necessarily, it doesn't say he met with all of them, and it doesn't say that he was doing it out of ego or pride or anything like that. He could have, but he signs it nonetheless, okay? And so he, they, I believe they were doing it for stability purposes. Now, look at the other thing. Go back to that scripture verse in verse 8. It says, according to the law of the Medes and Persians. You see that right there? Okay, this is emphasizing and underscoring and highlighting the fact that this is about the laws of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. It's underscoring that once it's in place, that's it. Okay, it cannot be changed. All right, we're going to see the importance of that as we move on in this story. Let's keep moving on. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Now, I want to say this. You see how it says in verse 10? It says, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed. Okay? Daniel was a smart man. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew the politics of the situation of that day, and he knew what these men were doing. Okay? He knew exactly when that bill became a law, so to speak. All right? It didn't surprise him. Okay? You don't see Daniel going back before Darius and saying, Darius, Darius, I think this is a bad idea. You shouldn't do it. Okay? Or Darius, you know what? They said all the commissioners came and before you. I wasn't there. You don't see Daniel asserting any authority, taking any advantage of his privileged position. What does he do? He says, when he knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, now on the roof. He had windows open toward Jerusalem. I'm going to come back to that. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. You see, Daniel is not doing something new. Daniel is doing something that he has consistently always done every day before this document was signed. You see, he, in fact, you see how it says windows pointed toward Jerusalem? If you go to 2 Chronicles 6, verse 36, Solomon commissions the temple. This is the temple that, that would replace Moses' sanctuary. He's dedicating it, and this is what he says. He's talking to the Lord. When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to a land far off or near. If they take thought in the land where they are taken captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, and we have acted wickedly, if they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in their land of their captivity, when they have been taken captive, and pray toward their land which you gave, which you have given to their fathers, and the city which you have chosen, and toward the house which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven from your dwelling place their prayer and supplications, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Okay, Daniel is what? He's facing towards Jerusalem. Now, we're going to see in chapter 9, he does the same thing. He's going to be praying and, and, and petitioning and making supplication before the Lord because of the sins of his people. He understands that 
They're taken into captivity because of their sin. Okay, here we see him praying towards the holy place, towards Jerusalem. All right, and this is the most important point I want you to hear about this. Basically, Daniel is consistent in his behavior because your destiny is determined by your daily decisions. Okay, your destiny is determined by your daily decisions. You know, if you're regularly in prayer and you're consistently exposing yourself to the Word of God and you're consistently walking in obedience, that is, gonna, that is your future. Because how we spend our days, how we use our time today, that is our tomorrow. I mean, think about this. Let's do a little intellectual exercise. Where you are today, your current situation, whatever it may be, add up the sum of your life, and I know circumstances happen behind our control, but largely we have decisions that we make every day. How we deal with tragedy in our life, how we deal with success in our life, how we manage our time, the things we choose to watch, the things we choose to engage ourselves with, the conversations we have, the people we hang out, we make decisions every day. And those decisions ultimately will lead us to tomorrow. They, they encapsulate the entirety of our beings in the state that we're in today, okay? So the decisions that you make today is your future, okay? So Daniel had been consistently praying, consistently bowing, consistently walking in obedience, and that brought him to this, his elderly age where he is now, distinguishing himself before Darius. He's not bothered by this decree. It doesn't affect him whatsoever. I mean, think about this. He knows the decree is signed. He knows that if he gives any worship to anyone other than Darius, he's to be thrown into the lion's den. Right? He knows that, that it's a death penalty. Okay? But despite that, he says, I'm going to continue worshiping the true God. It doesn't bother me. All right? It reminds me of Psalms 57 verse 4. David says, my soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. You see, we're constantly surrounded by lions. We have enemies. We have adversaries, maybe at work, at church, wherever we come or wherever we go. All right? People are constantly looking to take us down. Maybe not always, but there we have constant people maybe backbiting us, maybe doing things behind our back. But who do we look to? We look to the Lord God Almighty. We look to Him as, as our source and strength. He's the one that will deliver us. In fact, let's keep going. Verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Now stop right there. Think about this. They came by agreement. Okay, this was in agreement together. They knew that Daniel was going to continue to be faithful to his God. They knew he was going to continue to open his windows up towards Jerusalem and pray as he always had three times a day. They came by agreement and they what? They found him making petition. Keep reading. They found him making petition and supplication before his God. Verse 12. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any God or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed but keeps making his petition three times a day. Look at that. Look at the accusation against Daniel. He says, who, how do they now address Daniel? Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, by the way, okay? He doesn't pay any attention to you, O king, probably playing on his ego right here, 
okay, or to the injunction that you signed, meaning there's, the, he's, he's might be causing some instability here, but keeps making his petition three times a day, not just once. Okay, they emphasize that. This is his faithful devotion. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. Even until sunset, he kept exercising himself, himself to rescue him. Wow. The king knows he's been tricked. He knows that Daniel hasn't done anything wrong. And he realizes the situation. Now he's trying to figure out, how can I get Daniel out of this? Because I know he's a man of integrity. I know he has no intention to overthrow me, to do anything to hurt my administration. He's the one that's honest and true and faithful. So he's like, I've got to do something. But he's trapped by this law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. So look at verse 15. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king established may be changed. You see, they're leveraging off of the law of the land at that time. Like, there's no maneuvering room, king. You cannot find a loophole in here. This is it. You made this decree. It is invoked. It is established. It's permanent. It cannot be changed. And so the king is cornered. He can't do anything. Verse 16, then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. Now I've got to stop right there. King Darius, he's seen something in Daniel. He sees an extraordinary spirit. He knows he's done nothing wrong. Yet look how King Darius answers Daniel and responds to Daniel and entreats in Daniel as he allows him to be put and cast into the lion's den. What does he say? Go back to that verse. Your God whom you constantly serve. See that word constantly? Your God whom you daily serve. Your God whom you continually serve. Your God whom you hourly serve. Your God whom you do not compromise with. I know your integrity, Daniel. He himself will deliver you. I'm confident Darius heard of the stories of Daniel and of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and of the fiery furnace. And I know that he's heard of Daniel and interacted with him to know that the Spirit of God was upon this man. And so he believed in the true God that could be able to deliver him. I mean, who can deliver someone from the lion's den? I mean, Darius has a very different attitude about this. I mean, the reality is the lion's den is death, okay? That was to scare people. That was to intimidate people. That was a psychological uh, propaganda and, a, and a, a tool of the state that they were using to basically say, no, no one is going to be able to worship any god but you, Darius, okay? And people obeyed it, except Daniel knew that it was violating the laws of his God, the one true God, and he wasn't going to change his ways. And so Darius is so impressed with Daniel, he's convinced that he's worshiping the true God. He says, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Look at verse 17. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Meaning, his enemies, his friends, or anything, they wouldn't be able to figure out a way to try to get Daniel out of there. Okay, it's sealed. All right, it's done. Verse 18. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. You see, the king, he's troubled by this. I'm sure he, he had, had, had an endearing heart a connection, an emotional connection with Daniel because of his sincerity, because of his integrity, and now he's troubled. He knows an innocent man has been, has been wrongly cast in the lion's den, and it's partly his fault. So he doesn't take any entertainment, he doesn't take anything, no, and he couldn't even sleep. Okay, he's that concerned. Let's keep moving on. Verse 19, then the king arose at dawn. I can just imagine it. 
As soon as that sun started to break the horizon, he gets up at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. Went in haste. He didn't ca He's not casually walking. He's moving. He might even be jogging. All right. His attendants. I can, can you imagine? He's let's go. Can you imagine the servants kind of following behind him, trying to keep up with him? Now, when he had come near to the den, when he came near to the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? What a question. What a question. Now he's like, what happened? Did God deliver Daniel? Was, God's, was Daniel's God able to deliver him? Look what Daniel says. Look at the first words out of Daniel's mouth. I want you to see it in your Bible. It's up on the screen, verse 21. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. <laughs> what a statement. What a way to start that off. Think about this. You're in the lion's den. The king asked the question, has your God been able to deliver you? And what does Daniel say? O king, live forever. He's praising the king. He's, he's, he, he's basically giving homage and honor to the king. Okay? And he says what this? He says, back to the verse, verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. A miracle. An absolute miracle. The Lord delivered Daniel, okay? And the king was elated. Let's keep going. Verse 24, the king then gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them, their children and their wives into the lion's den and they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Probably, some people might say, wow, even the even the children, even the sons, even the whole families were cast in. Some people say, wow, doesn't that seem a bit cruel? I don't think so. In the broadest sense, fathers are responsible for their families. Okay. It's most likely that these families knew about the situation and were part of this particular plot. Okay. And in any case, back in those times, you didn't want to leave any family members around because if those family members, those sons were to grow up, they might have taken vengeance against Darius. Okay. So Darius is like, I'm going to shut this down once and for all, wipe out these families. Okay. Once and for all, that's it. Okay. And that's the justice that they got. Okay. Because of their conspiracy, because of their, their, their false accusations against Daniel. Then look what Darius says after he does this. Verse 25, then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land. Now, just, I want to point this out. Is this to just a, a small group or a segment of his kingdom, or is this to everyone in the kingdom? It's to everyone. Okay, peoples, nation, men of every language. He says, may your peace abound. Wow, same thing that King Nebuchadnezzar said when he realized the Most High rules over mankind and bestows it on over whomever he wishes. Okay, may your peace abound. May you have peace. Verse 26, I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Wow, Darius is utterly convinced and convicted that Daniel's God is the one true God. He sees a miracle because of Daniel's continual faithful serving him and doesn't follow after the laws of the Medes and Persians. Okay, we're going to stop right there because what we want to do in the next lesson is unpack this. Because the pattern of this lesson right here, Daniel and Lion's Den, that happened in, in ancient times... In, in literal Medo-Persia, in that Babylonian region and everything, we're going to see how this story directly applies to end times. Because if you understand that the laws of the Medes and Persians against the laws of Daniel, against the laws of God, sorry, the laws of God, 
you're going to see that same pattern will emerge in end times. So let's come back in the second part of Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to unpack that all and show you how this all unfolds. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I just pray that we would continually, daily serve you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to live holy, obedient lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, there are study guides. You can click on them, download them, use them with your Bible, write notes, interact with the scriptures. We want you to know this material and we want you to be ready for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time.